So my name is uh, Veronica Gill from uh, the CCDMD. I'm just going to do a very short intro um, to say that uh, we congratulate <laughs> Linda for her great resource that just came out. We had the, the launch uh, at John Abbott a few weeks ago, mm -hmm. a few months ago, and I'll just let her say okay. the rest. <laughs> Thank you, Veronica. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, Veronica is from the CCDMD, and I've been working with one of her colleagues, Michel Hardy Vallée, for five years to produce this website. The website is called the Research Competition, as you can see from the um, landing page. And I call it TRC. So you'll have to excuse me. I'm so used to using the acronym. T for the R for research and C for competition. So you'll hear me often saying TRC. I started putting up my agenda, and I didn't put up, finish putting up my agenda, and I just have one other um, item to put up. And I'm not necessarily going to follow items two and three uh, in a linear fashion, sort of in line with the concept map discussion that we just had. <laughs> so I'm going to put in, um, no, how does TRC relate to RETSIC, in particular to the five uh, competencies or the skills. I don't know if that door is locked, but uh. <laughs> okay. So the first thing I wanted to do was to have you introduce yourselves, and uh, it would be interesting for myself, and I think for everyone else in this room, to have an idea of maybe what you're concerned with with respect to um, using a tool like this or what is it that might interest you at your institution in doing something like this so something that resonates with you in terms of having read the description of this activity and and what you're maybe hoping to get out of it or hope to have addressed but I'll give you a little bit of time to think about that I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself because um, I think it's important for you to understand uh, where this came from and it really organically grew out of my interest um, as a teacher. I started teaching in 1983 at Vanier College as a political science teacher. I moved over to um, John Abbott College in the early 1990s and I started teaching in the research methods courses in the social science program at a very early point at staying at John Abbott College and I just fell in love with the research methods courses. Who here has heard of the research methods courses? Okay, so it just gives me a sense of where everyone's at. That's not going to be my emphasis today. My emphasis today is really to um, look at the genesis of where this website is coming from in terms of my journey as a teacher and as a person who likes to produce instructional materials in a very innovative way. In fact, my second name is Linda Innovation Gelston. I love innovating. Um, and also that I'm coming out of a philosophical tradition, which some of you may have heard about, called constructivism. And constructivism is very much in line with the whole Perrin report, like the original founding principles of the CEGEP system, which is that the CEGEP college experience is supposed to be based on the students and be student-centered. So everything I've done since I started teaching has always been to somehow meet the student where the student is at, and try to bring them one, two, or three, maybe even more steps forward from where they were at the start. Uh, the focus is on the student as the learner, learner, not as me as the expert. A few other things. Um, I, hmm, Steel, Steelcase is deciding to give me the interactive board. Do you know why that might be doing it all on its own? Yeah. I was wondering why you guys started to look funny. See if this is going to come back. Yes, it did. Thank goodness. <laughs> okay. Um, one of the reasons why I started working on this website with the CCDMD was because I wanted to provide both students and teachers with an opportunity to experience the research methods courses in a more engaging way. And by engaging, what I mean is that both the teachers and the students 
would really be engaged in a very transformative experience when they were learning their research methods material. Um, they'd be creating shared experiences by engaging in role play scenarios. And in playing role play scenarios, you never play the same scenario the same way twice. So for the teachers, they never end up playing the same game or competition twice. It's never the same. And for the students, it really creates an experience where they can continue talking about the simulation or the scenario that they played through theatrically at the beginning of the course for the rest of the semester and even beyond. They often talk about their experience with um, the competition or with the game. I'm not going to go into too many details about that, but it's just to let you know I'm interested as a political science teacher, as a research methods teacher, very innovative. I turned to the CCDMD to help me turn it around to actually make um, this approach to teaching uh, research methods available beyond my immediate colleagues. Um, so that's the result of this. So now I'm just going to turn to you to have you do some introductions. It would be nice to say what your name is, the institution that you're from, and I think we're going to have to use the microphone for the help of people who are or will be listening later on. And could you just say something if you, if you want, you're not obliged, but maybe why you're here or what interests you? Hello, I'm André Dagenet, I'm a librarian at Centre de Documentation Collégiale. Oh, does she have to stand up? Oh, you want her to stand up? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I didn't give good directions. <laughs> it's okay. So I'm André Dagenet, librarian at the Centre de Documentation Collégiale. And, well, I was interested about uh, um, how to help students learn how to search in, in general, to search databases or uh, to, uh, to, well, to improve their uh, analysis. Thank you. We may as well, if you don't mind, we'll continue sort of in a zigzag. Okay. Uh, Marie-Jeanne Carrière, technopedagogue from APA. In another life, uh, teacher, research methods, research teacher, <laughs> and always looking for ways to help the students succeed and help the teachers. Brenda Lamb, John Abbott College. So I uh, was at the launch of uh, the project, and it was, I think you're going to be very pleased with it. So I'm here to, I would like to learn more about ways that I can present the resource to teachers who may not know about it, because Linda has, Linda did such an amazing job that she's now retired. <laughs> so it would be nice now that she's no longer at the college, although we'll bring you back, I'm sure for presentations to, um, to be able, how to explain it to them and how to be able to support their use of it. Okay. Thank you. Oui, oui, et tu peux poser des questions en français aussi, ok? okay? Merci, ben, en fait, je sais parler anglais, mais ça fait pas longtemps que je suis conseillère pédagogique. Je sais même pas comment dire conseillère pédagogique en anglais. Ok, merci. <rire> <rire> euh, tout pas, c'est ça. Euh, mais euh, donc, je suis ici euh, parce que je suis conseillère pédagogique réptique, mais aussi euh, j'accompagne le programme de sciences humaines, puis j'accompagne tous les programmes de technique humaine, puis les recherches, euh, les méthodes de recherche, c'est vraiment au cœur. Puis même, il y a un programme qui se questionne vraiment beaucoup sur la façon dont on l'enseigne. Donc, pour moi, c'est vraiment ça, aller chercher des idées sur les méthodes de recherche. I'm Patty Kingsmill. I'm from Vanier College, and... Uh, like Julie, I'm not only a reptic, but um, most of my work is actually with program management, revision, uh, assessment. So uh, I, I'm hoping eventually to be working on the revision for uh, the social sciences, which is coming down the pipe in a while. And I want to support teachers uh, in, in RM. So. Oh. Hi, I'm a. She, does she no, want I don't, you to I don't stand, think so. I, think, I don't think so. No, okay. I'm good. <laughs> I'm uh, Marie Fortin. I'm, I'm working still like uh, um, a pedagogical counselor. So I said that very, very fast too. And I'm not a reptic, so I, I'm just here because I'm curious about it and I want to develop uh, an expertise and knows a little bit more about all the resources that we can have. Hi, 
I'm invisible. No, I'm uh, Gabrielle Levert. I work with Nicole Perrault at the IT Rep Network, and I'm here mostly to support the um, webcast, but it seems like a very interesting subject, and I'm eager to learn more. Thanks. Hi, I'm uh, Judith from uh, Champlain College. I'm a Reptic and Education Advisor, and uh, our um, IM course is being revised actually next fall, so oh. this is falling right in line at the right time. <laughs> my name is Guylaine. Oh. Oh. Pardon. So my name is Guylaine from André Grasset. I'm a Reptic also, and I was curious about this project. I'm Sophie Balatin from La Salle College, and I'm the Documentation Center Coordinator. So I give regularly workshops on information retrieval. Uh, that's why I was particularly interested by this presentation. Hi, I'm Pascal. I, I work at La Vitrine Technology Education, well, since a few months, since January. Uh, at La Vitrine, it's like CCMD. We are supporting all the college and the CGEP. And we are more interested in new technology and uh, new way of teaching. So I'm very interested. Perhaps I don't speak. <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in uh, well role play scenarios and uh, to 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 learn more uh, how it supports uh, learning in research. Oh. I think that comp. Yes, I know. Does that complete the table round? I think we, we covered everyone. Essentially, this is for me because nobody can read my writing, but I just wanted to know where um, you were all coming from, and I could sort of alter my presentation to better suit the needs of the people in here, and that really gives me a lot of information. Um, I'm also used to working in a classroom like this, so that's why I asked someone to go run and get me more pens, because I may be asking you guys to do a little bit of work and actually posting up your boards in the classroom. Okay? The only thing I'm not, I don't have access to is the interactive board, because I'm not familiar with this one. I'm usually using the smart board. So I have to keep sitting down and um, finding my place on my website, so you have to excuse me for jumping up and down. Okay, so there's our table ronde. Very good. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the TRC, so this website. Uh, as you can see uh, there on the landing page um, is a beautiful photo of an actual game that I played with my students in a research methods class probably about four years ago. And uh, we've been playing this game, we call it the funds game, now for probably 15, 16 years. So almost every single research methods teacher plays this funds game at the beginning of the semester. And it's particularly interesting for teachers who are teaching it for the first time because it allows them to launch into the session and to get the students preparing presentations on a topic of the teacher's choice, usually a strength that the teacher may have. So for me, it would be political violence because I'm a political science teacher or immigration. And then the students are expected to prepare research proposals from each one of the 10 social science disciplines. Wow. The reason why I created this is probably back in I guess, the early 90s when I first came to John Abbott. I was in my basement thinking about how am I going to go into my research methods class and tell them about the different social science disciplines. Anthropology is this. Business is that. Commerce is that. Economics is, I said, no, I can't do that. It's just, it's just, it's not in me. And I also know that maybe 5% of what I would have presented to the students in that way would have been retained. So as a political science teacher, I'm used to using simulations. So we always had mock parliamentary debates or debates of any kind. Um, also, I'm very involved with the model United Nations. Um, club that's um, a youth club and they reenact all kinds of different gatherings from a general assembly gathering all the way to perhaps a board of directors gathering. So it was easy for me to say how can I take this up to a level where I think I could deepen the learning and actually the students would be able to retain a lot more and we would actually create a shared experience. So whoa, like that would be great. So 
I run into the classroom all excited as usual. In fact, when I would run in with that look on my face, my students get to know me pretty quickly. They go, oh no, what has she got up her sleeve? What's she going to make us do? <laughs> so, <laughs> that first time I said, listen, I really would like you to try something new with me. And we did it within the same week. It was very quick turnover, in fact. I'm, I'm surprised that I had asked my students to do that. Um, but they did very well. They were very excited about it being something new that we were trying. And it was, it was good. First start, learned a lot. Um, and through the years, through practicing, I've made adjustments. And I came out with this guide in 2009. And it was very difficult to deliver to the teachers because there wasn't much information. And there wasn't much that they could actually give to the students. So, you know, they're always saying, well, can you give us more or can you develop more materials? So that's where the CCD DMD came into play. I said, yes, I'm tired of having to send the folder of this material and people always coming, oh, can you explain this or can you give me more of these and can you give me samples of the student papers? So what was great about the CCDMD is they were able to allow me to put all of this up in nice, neat, um, contained areas of a website. And what was great about working with Michel Hadivalli from the CCDMD is he pushed it further. He said, let's not just have the funds game, which is the game that I've been playing or we've been playing at John Abbott College in research methods for the past uh, 17 years or something. Let's take it to some other levels. So there are three, I'm so used to being up at the board, this is very uncomfortable for me to be sitting here like this. There are three um, role play scenarios. So the first role play scenario is the one that I was just talking about, it's called the funds game. And the funds game has all the instructions, everything that you would need, that I was able to give them to my colleagues finally, and say, listen, it's all there. There's sample material, video footage, photographic images. There are scripts for the students. And I think most importantly, and this is something that was really good about working with Michelle at the CCDMD, is we decided that the teacher needed a script. So pedagogically speaking, you know, we're, all, we're used to delivering instructional material to our students. We're not used to directing instructional material to fellow teachers. Because the teachers are also expected to play a role when you're role playing in a scenario. The teacher has to step back in certain ways and at certain times. The teacher has to become a director or a facilitator as opposed to the person who is magisterially in charge. Okay, so it really required a script for the teacher. So here, um, in this particular scenario, there's three of them. This is the first one, the one that I developed, and I, I would say is the one that we really encourage research methods teachers to try out, even if they're new, and right at the beginning of the course, because it just sets such a beautiful tone for the course. So the teacher determines a topic, usually a topic that the teacher feels very comfortable with. You have the description here so the, teach, the teacher and the students can readily go to any device. So the um, address is, you have these little confetti pieces on the desk there, the research.ccdmd.qc.ca and the logiciel or whatever you call it that was chosen for the website was specifically chosen so it would be easy for students to access it on any of their devices. And when I played this, um, last semester, when I was still teaching, <laughs> the students had their phones and their devices going all the time. Like someone would say to the other person, oh, like I forgot, what, what was I supposed to do? And well, is it before that or that? Well, just look on the website, what's your problem? So everything is really there, much more than you have in that little booklet, which was just for um, teachers. So you have a description of what it is. There are different roles. So almost all of the students in the classroom would be the researchers. So the researchers could be the anthropologists, the geographers, the political scientists, the historians. Um, all of the social science disciplines would be included as the researchers. So they have a role. They're expected to compete to win research funding. So there's actually money involved. You can make any amount involved uh, uh, available that you would like. I just put a million dollars. 10 social science disciplines or fewer if you want, if you have a small class. 
Um, and they're competing as small groups to be supported with the research proposals. And they're trying to make their case, they're pitching their case to a panel of judges, like a National Research Council of Judges. And the judges set criteria which they derive actually from real research sites. So they set criteria based upon what they deem to be the most important or significant criteria that they're seeing on NSERC or on the SHRC site, any of the um, major uh, funding sites. So they're getting involved and in learning a little bit more about how research is actually uh, funded and supported. Then we have two journalists. The two journalists are taking notes. They're eventually writing a report. And we have a general public, and the general public is there really to show the counterpoint of the non-scientific way of thinking. Because what we're doing is we're, with this, with everything that this website's about, we're initiating students into the world of research. We want them not just to behave as researchers, we want them to think, we want them to read, we want them to write like researchers. So when I'd have a student saying to me, oh miss, this, this literature review, I can't do it, I can't, I can't take these articles, I can't make sense of these articles, and then you want me to like synthesize a few articles and make sense, I just can't do it. And one of the things I say is, well, you're playing a role. When you take your English course, you're asked to write in your English course, you're asked to behave as a person who's in English literature. When you're in a history course and you're asked to produce a history essay, you're being asked to play the part of a historian. When you're a psychologist as a researcher, you're being asked to play the role of a researcher. You need to behave like a researcher. So that was another thing that Michelle and myself, well, I developed, but Michelle prompted me, was really to build up a lot of um, material and support on the website to initiate students into how to think like researchers. So one of the things in this, the researcher script asks the students to actually go to their association site. So if they're anthropologist, they're directed to go to the American Anthropological Association site or the Canadian Anthropological Association site or the Canadian Political Science Association site and actually look at what these professionals are doing. And there's guided questions in the script that they're expected to answer. So for instance, like what do political scientists do to promote political science as a discipline? What kind of activities do you see them promoting on the website? Uh, what kind of uh, support do they give to students? Uh, what, are they, what are they providing to students? Is it funding to do research? Is it having them travel abroad to work in research um, institutes? So it really gives them a flavor for, if they're being asked to behave like a researcher, well then find out how researchers actually behave in their professional associations. So there's a lot of that reinforcement on the website, particular in the scripts. So we have the general public who's the counterpoint. They're not the researchers. They're um, thinking according to common sense notions. They're not thinking like scientists, and my students have a hard time doing this. So the two students who are usually selected to be the general public, I tell them they probably have the most difficult task because they have to unlearn any little bit of scientific learning that they have thus far acquired, and they, they're surprisingly a lot that they've already acquired by the third semester in our college when they take RM. Like they have to unthink themselves out of like scientific ways of thinking. And that's uh, quite um, a revelation, I think. And then there's a teacher script. So we have the what is it. The player scripts are here. They're quite involved. So you can actually get the general public who's playing by students. You can get the researchers being played by students. You get the journalist and the judges all being played by students to go to their scripts and diligently fill out their scripts. It's on a time frame. So there's actually uh, steps they need to follow uh, by certain parts. So it's very structured. Okay? It's not just, oh, just go fill out the script. It's a very structured um, uh, script and uh, system. There's also um, rules and a code of conduct. I really liked doing this. I found it fun. When I looked at science fairs. And you know, in the natural sciences, they have science fairs. We don't have anything like this that I know of in the social sciences. So there's something here that's like that. But I thought that I'd sort of borrow from them the notions of how you're supposed to behave if you're at a science fair. So how are you supposed to behave 
if you're sitting in a classroom and you're acting out a competition for research funding? Like, how are the judges expected to behave? How are the researchers expected? And how are the journalists expected to behave? So each one of the roles has its own rules and code of conduct. It's also situated in, sorry, this gets you dizzy. <laughs> it's also situated in um, research ethics and understanding that if your researchers or judges, um, even uh, journalists who are covering research um, funding events, you have to understand that there are different levels of ethics. So the first level of ethics is in the game itself. There's rules of conduct that they're expected to follow. You have research, um, or sort of the institutional research ethics, and they sort of say, what's that? I said, well, look on the website. You're going to see that if researchers want to do research in the college, they have to follow research ethics. And then we have funding bodies like SHRC, and they have their own research ethics and codes. You have professional associations. You have government laws and regulations, like civil code that governs issues of consent. And then all the way to Geneva Conventions of like do no harm and some other international types of ethics. So it really is getting the students into the world of thinking, reading, writing, behaving like researchers. So and, and this part of the website I really, really love and I'm so appreciative of Michelle for sitting there over lunch with me on many, many occasions, <laughs> pushing this a little bit further all the time. Okay, so here you have um, the scripts, you have sample material, so the students actually have sample research proposal material of research proposals that were presented. There are sample topics for teachers as well. I think there are about seven or eight different topics, sort of describes a topic that could be chosen. And then I have some abstracts on the topic of, I believe it's immigration, from each one of the disciplines. So the students are sort of saying like, how is it that anthropology is going to present a different approach to geography? Well, so let's go look at the abstracts on the immigration that I wrote and just see that there is a different emphasis um, in each one of the disciplines. There's a different discourse, a different discourse communities in the social science um, uh, program. And we have to respect that. Like we don't try to, as teachers, show that Social science research is all of one piece. It's not of one piece. They're very distinct traditions. And so what I like about the game is that it sustains that distinctiveness of the different disciplines and asks the researchers to behave in a small group as if they are anthropologists and distinguish themselves from historians or psychologists. And it adds a lot of wonderful content, rich content, to the course. And students tend to recall a lot of the material. Technically, is everything working? Ça, 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 ça marche? Ça fonctionne? Oui? Okay. <laughs> okay. Are there any questions? Uh, yes. I think I need to give you the microphone, right? Uh, yeah, well, you're the one who told me. <laughs> and just to identify yourself, if you don't okay. mind. Okay. Alors, uh, Marie-Jeanne from APAP. Um, I was just wondering, the role playing is that the Okay, I'm going to have to think about it. Okay, the role playing. Does the student play the same role during the whole semester? No. Good question. Or do they change during the semester? Okay. So I'm going to call up the time frame, or I don't even have to do that. Good question. So for the funds game, this scenario, normally we play it out over four or five weeks and I advise to start the semester with this. And you start with um, just setting up the game. The teacher decides on the topic, and the teacher starts to designate which social science disciplines are going to be assigned, how many people given the class size would belong in each one of those groups. All the materials there, by the way. It's, yeah. It's. And then um, the teacher asks the students, once they get into their roles, to actually go to their scripts start preparing. So that could take about two weeks, maybe two and a half weeks. And I have the ponderation here too, which is a pretty close estimate at this point about how much time is required of your lecture period in the research methods, how much is required of the lab time in the research methods course, and about how much is homework time. And it's pretty light right at the beginning, gets a bit heavy in the preparatory time, and then it lightens up towards the end. So once they do all their preparations, once their scripts are, are ready, they've 
design their research proposals and they're ready to present their research proposals to the judges who have set their criteria. Everyone has work to do and it's pretty equal. Um, we call it gameplay. And the gameplay is towards the end of the maybe four, five, you could even extend it to seven weeks if you want, but usually we put it in a few weeks and it's pretty flexible. After the gameplay, we have the reflection and sort of debrief. And that's where the real learning is assessed. That's where you really get to you know, where the students are thinking, what they're thinking happens in social science research. And you're, you're asking pointed questions, and I have a, a list of about 50 reflection questions from which you can choose two or three to ask the students to reflect on what is social science research? How is social science knowledge constructed? What are the types of things that anthropologists seem to do that maybe psychologists don't appear to do based on the presentations? So that would run maybe three if you're really like condensing it. Four weeks I'm more comfortable, but you could extend this to five or six weeks. You don't have to exclusively focus just on this while you're teaching the course because there's a lot of material to cover, but um, it does get the students starting to deal with the course content pretty quickly. So at the beginning when you're trying to find out what social science research, your whole presentation to the students could be talking about how you have different disciplines and look, you're going to play some roles and you're going to let us know exactly what it is you can do with that topic. Um, you also talk about the difference between scientific way of knowing and non-scientific ways of knowing. So the general public will represent that non-scientific way of knowing so that you can deal with what are the differences? What is distinct or discernible about scientific knowledge and approaches to thinking? Yeah. yeah. And also obtaining information. Okay, so um, I have this in terms of this learning activity, this particular scenario. I extracted this quote. I'm sort of paying homage to some of the research that's behind um, doing this um, this website and I really like the way it's focusing on how what we're trying to do with the funds game and the other scenarios is to um, create communities of practice so that within the college you'll have a sense that there is this thing called the social sciences and the social sciences is comprised of different social science disciplines and there's a certain frame of mind or habit of mind that you're trying to encourage the students to adopt as social science students. And I think it creates an identity for the program. I think it creates an identity uh, for the students. And I think it might even help to make them recognize that the social science program is not a step below the natural science program. So anyway, I took this quotation, which I absolutely adore, from Kolb and Kolb, 2005. This is on the website. Um, Knowledge resides not in the individual's head, but in communities of practice. So I'm thinking that when the students are in their anthropology group, their history group, or their geography group, or their judges group, that they're sort of getting into a community of practice, a way of thinking, they're being scripted, right? To, to think about how a researcher would think or a judge. Learning is thus a process of becoming a member of a community of practice through legitimate peripheral participation, e.g. apprenticeship. I don't know why they didn't just say apprenticeship. Situated learning theory enriches the learning space concept by reminding us that learning spaces extend beyond the teacher and the classroom. I'm going to ex explain this in a minute because this can go beyond the classroom. This is what I love about it. Um, they include socialization into a wider community of practice that involves membership, identity formation, transitioning from novice to expert through mentorship and experience in the activities of the practice, as well as the reproduction and development of the community of practice itself as newcomers replace old timers, where they really do start to feel they are becoming researchers and thinking like researchers. Okay, um, the other scenario is uh, the Research Institute. And the Research Institute is um, a peer-based research institute setting where the teacher would and the script is there for the teacher to set a particular topic and um, you would assign students to different social science disciplines and they're actually producing written research proposals which involves writing a literature review it involves um, choosing a method plan both of which are very very difficult the first funds game scenario is light-hearted it's a great initiation because you don't have to write anything down. You're flying a little bit by the seat of your pants with this one, and it's okay. I'm not asking for a formal bibliography for the 
funds game, but we get a little bit more serious with the Research Institute. If you use the website, you don't have to use any of the material you don't want to. You don't have to necessarily use the Research Institute. You could just use the funds game, or you could just use the Research Institute, or you could just extract parts that you find are pertinent to your particular needs, okay? So the Research Institute involves a lot more of the reptic um, skills, which I want to refer to in a few seconds, and there's a lot of peer review, and they're actually behaving like research associates in a research institute. Not only are they peer reviewing each other, but they're actually responding to peer uh, reviews. So there's responses to the peer review because I think we often stop short in our peer review activities of just having the peer do the review and then it stops at that. So there is a chance for a response and also it's shown how this is very much practiced um, by professionals. Is you have a chance to respond. You don't always have to agree with um, the peers uh, review of your work. So as I was saying, there are very difficult tasks involved in this. How, how many of you have ever tackled teaching, writing, something like a review of the research or research like a method plan? Okay, what's, so, so it's, it's difficult. So one of the, another one of the reasons why I tried to build the tools in this website is because I was, I was like, I was banging my head against the wall and going home crying sometimes because I, I was assigning the literature review and they were just falling. Like they, they, they were failing, they were falling by the wayside, they were becoming so discouraged with the course. So I said, we don't have enough scaffolding, there's not enough material to help them with their searching for information, with their processing of the information, with the actual um, you know, tips on how to write in a scientific way. Mm -hmm. So I built some two tools that I'm going to show it to you in a minute. I don't want to spend too much time on each of the scenarios. I want to focus on the tools because I think that's more um, pertinent to the Reptic conference. So this is the second scenario. It's a step above. It's more difficult work for the students. They probably have already done the funds game before they would even enter into this. And this might even be a graduating uh, course. Maybe they're integrating activity course. And the third one is the collegiate contest. And what I like about the collegiate contest is this is the science fair. This is where you cut across classrooms, where the tools that are provided here to help students write a research proposal, or even if you just want a competition for a literature review, that would be fine, across classes, across sections, as you could, with the agreement of the teachers, one of the teachers actually deciding to take a leading role, the lead research director, and would set up sort of a schedule, and there's a suggested schedule there, and I have application forms for student contestants who are interested in applying uh, for the research contest, um, the collegiate contest, to win the, the prize of the college. So if there are nine sections of RM being offered, and maybe four teachers agree to participate, well, that's the collegiate contest. It's those four sections. It's uh, voluntary on the part of the teachers, voluntary on the part of the students. They don't have to be a part of the collegiate contest. And you have all the entry forms and the rules of conduct, and it's like a science fair, and it's just quite exciting. So that's there. That's never been tried. Um, we would feature the prize winners up on the website, and I think even an abstract of their work. So there are some perks to it. <laughs> So those are the three role play scenarios. So the idea is we're really asking students to role play the part of researchers, okay? So two seconds, I'm just, uh, okay. So in terms of, I'm gonna get into the reptic part now, okay? So in terms of the pedagogical objectives, I've linked this directly with the competencies for the course, the research methods. It also abides very well with the quantitative methods course and also with the integrating activity course. There are bits and pieces of it that you could integrate. The uh, first four items, a li little difficult to see. This is directly from the competencies for um, the 022Q for the research methods courses course. And these are the four out of the seven um, competencies or elements of the competency and these four are directly addressed um, with the role play scenarios so it's like it's dead on in terms of addressing 
the, um, the competencies. Um, in addition to that, it also can address the involvement recognition. I think you have this, they call it SIR, Student Involvement Recognition Service, or your ac acronym may be different from college to college. Um, but serving as a judge in the collegiate contest as a student could qualify you for enough hours to um, have your recognition because it's regarded as a scientific contribution. I didn't know this before, but when I looked at it, in the area of science, contributory involvement, students can contribute significantly to one or more extracurricular activities that require them to take on responsibilities, take initiative, show leadership, and enhance learning. Specifically in the area of science, scientific or technical activities that involve research, testing, or communication that raise the level of interest and knowledge in science and technology, Learning associated with methodology, rigor, ingenuity, analysis, and synthesis is recognized. It's a direct quote um, from the um, SIRS recognition um, at the provincial level. So it's another sort of plus to try to encourage extracurricular activity or co-curricular activity. And then finally, the ICT profile. I should be able to increase the size of this. It's when you're not with your own computer. <coughs> okay, so also the ICT profile for students. I fell into Reptic quite by accident. I was actually doing um, a study on literacy and RM, which I uh, co-authored with an anthropology teacher. And we were also, we were both crying mm -hmm. about how difficult it was for students to actually meet those competencies in a reasonable way. and. Um, one of the things we're doing was trying to do a needs assessment about what the college could do, what the system could do, what the teachers could do, what kind of instruction materials could be brought to bear to better support the students in meeting those competencies because it it's darn hard. So um, I started understanding, you know, literacy is a big, broad term, and it ended up bringing me to the Reptic site, and I started reading a lot more about the Reptic and understanding that my game actually fit very much with the Reptic um, skills. So here I actually identified that four out of the five skills are really focused on in the role play scenarios. Um, in particular the search for information. So in the student scripts there and in the teacher script as well, not detailed because I, I couldn't encumber the scripts with too much blah 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 blah. Michelle helped me be less blah, 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 blah. It's one of the things we suffer from as teachers <laughs> in giving instructions, like way too many pages of instructions. But the advice is if you're looking for particular types of information, like if you're the general public, I'm actually asking the students to go on blogs. I am saying, what are you telling me to go on blogs for? I said, well, I need you to know what the general public are talking about with respect to immigration or political violence because you have to replicate that understanding. You've got to get into their mindset. So no, but we have to go to the databases. No, you don't have to go to the, you don't go to the databases. I don't want you to think like a scientist. Whereas the <coughs> researchers are being told to conduct an academic search. They say, oh, can I Google that? No. <laughs> and the instructions to the teachers as well is that you're going to have in your lab setting students conducting different types of searches. And sometimes you're going to be looking at someone else's computer. But they're going on Google. <laughs> and that's a perfect learning opportunity for students to understand that there are different types of needs when you're doing um, searches for information. It's a great, great, great teaching opportunity. I also became very close to the um, uh, reference librarians. I visited Champlain. I was very interested in all kinds of things going on with uh, searching um, and search tools and got very involved with Zotero. If any of you ever heard of the Zotero, the free system for managing your files, and that didn't go very far. It was kind of difficult. But anyway. The search for information is very much a part of the work in the role play scenarios. Processing information, big, 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 big. I want to come back to this because I know I don't have much time and I want to get some questions from you. Let me come back to it in a second. Presenting information, they're presenting orally, they're presenting in writing, depending on which scenario they're in. They're actually having to play role acts when they are presenting. And when the students tell me, Miss, I'm having trouble writing a literature review because I'm having to write in such a formal way, I just say, please just pretend. I know it sounds silly. Pretend that you are a psychologist. Just pretend when you're writing. So you can take on that stance, that writing stance. So 
Um, the working in a network, unless you're talking about the collegiate um, contest, I didn't quite use that as being a, a, a point that we actually touch upon much or I touch upon much in the website. And then the use ICTs in an efficient and responsible manner in terms of ethics, in terms of citizenship, um, mm -hmm. that's very much touched upon. But let me talk about the process information. Um, and this is the last thing that I really wanted to talk about. This took a lot of my time. My project manager would send me home and say, okay, you've got three weeks, four weeks or something. I know you can do it, Linda. You've got to get a different way of getting the students to think about writing a literature review. Okay, how can you actually show them physically how to put it together? Like, how do you break it down? Instead of just writing about it in words, step one, you do this, step two, you do that. How do you break it down? Same thing with the method plan. How do you help them make decisions about whether they're going to have a thesis, a hypothesis, if it's going to be this variable or that variable? Questions like that. So I um, used my innovative skills <laughs> and designed two tools that I'm really proud of, and I think it, it's relevant to this conference. So what I'd like you to do, I'm going to give you a board. We're going to do a little bit of... Uh, of an activity here is I'm going to show you my two tools. What is it done here? It didn't give me my, my back button, sorry. So can everyone grab a board from the wall or one that's free? And see if you each have a pen. You might, some of you may have to share a pen. I have uh, markers. <laughs> you have to play. <laughs> I love these boards. So you, you do, do you teach in this classroom? You teach in this classroom? But do you use those boards? Aren't they great? Oh, they're great. OK. I'm good. I'm just going to get back to where. <laughs> Does everyone have a pen? They'll share? What's this Adobe Flash player? Oh dear. Um, I don't have the internet, it seems. It, or the Adobe. It's saying I need Adobe. Maybe I'll go to this one. I had the I had the videos open before. Here, I'll try it here. They were. Oh. Do you guys have that problem when you're at the? Everyone's waiting for you and you can't do it. <laughs> okay. Update plugin. What is it? Uh, well, it's, I can't because it's not giving me the videos. Go to Internet Explorer. Okay, I'll try that one. So let me explain. So there are two tools here. There are two tools here. Do you want me to hold it? No, no, closer to the speaker when you start the video. So if people are on the web with here. Yes, okay. Is that close enough? Or here? Yeah, yeah, it should be okay. Oh, the speaker's there? Okay. Okay, so um, one of the things that I designed for writing the literature review um, was something called the confetti method. So this is the information processing. So what I did was I broke it down and I said to the students, you're expected to find a number of research articles, very high level, very difficult reading. 
So there is actually a list of um, prompts to ask them to respond to the prompts and they more or less have um, dissected the essential information mm -hmm. from the research article. Then I asked them to take notes on colored sheet of sheets of paper so that, um, let's just say their first study, I, they're going to assign an orange color to it. They can either strike orange pen through the sheet, but their notes that they're extracting from the prompts in their own words about the study, summarizing the study, will be on an orange sheet or orange colors. And you do that for each of your sources. You guys have probably used something like this in your own studies. I just sort of formalized it and modified it a bit from some other existing systems. So each one of the, the sources will have a color. And one of the problems with the literature review is that the students were producing literature reviews that were sequential, essentially annotated bibliography. So they would say, well, in article number one, they said this, blah, 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 for two paragraphs. Article number two, they said this, blah, 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 blah. It wasn't synthesized. They weren't emerging from it with some kind of a research question that was not answered, which is what they're required to do in the research methods course. They're, they're required to generate questions. And that's where you generate questions from in a research context. So I, what happened is I, I started to require 10% of the mark was based on them doing this. I said, I don't care if you don't like it. You're going to do it so then I don't end up getting the Article 1 and Article 2 and Article 3. Like, you can't mess it up very much <laughs> if you follow the system. So it's called the, I called it the confetti way. And um, it was still hard to show the students physically how to do this. And then you regroup your information into themes. They, they put them in baggies. I didn't ask them for baggies. Some of them put them in baggies. So this was them synthesizing the different um, information from the sources together in meaningful ways. So this video is one of the most important videos that I've ever produced and will ever produce. And I keep hearing it around the college all the time. And it's the confetti way. It can help in a lot of different contexts for synthesizing multiple sources. It doesn't only have to be for a lit review. So I'm going to play this. What I'd like you to do with your boards is I'd like you to write down what kind of application you think um, this could be used for in your particular case, because I know you're from all different backgrounds. Also, what do you think is pedagogically sound about this or pedagogically interesting about something like this? Any one of those things. Just write something on the board as a response or reaction to the three-minute video. And I know we're running short on time. A literature review assignment can feel like a mess of text with no beginning or end. The Confetti Way is a simple 10-step method to find direction and put some color back into your writing. The Confetti Way will help you summarize and synthesize your sources, making it easy to create an outline, write, and reference your review. Step one is to locate and evaluate sources on your topic. The number and type of sources you need is determined by the style of review you must write. Literature reviews can be standalone works or components within larger papers. They can be selective or more comprehensive depending on the project. Their purpose is to provide an account of significant research on a given topic. In CGIP and undergraduate work, literature reviews are usually placed in the introduction section of research proposals or papers. A well-synthesized review demonstrates your grasp of the scholarly conversation. Avoid popular publications and websites which are not acceptable forms of scientific information. Use only authoritative sources whose authors provide methodical accounts of their findings. For step two, use for each selected source a different colored paper to help you keep track of them. Step three is to make summary notes for each source using the colored paper assigned to each. For step four, get up the scissors and cut each individual summary note into a confetti piece. You should end up with a large pile of multicolored confetti pieces. Step five is synthesis and organization. A literature review is not a sequential list of source information. That's an annotated bibliography. Instead, source information should be mixed together and sorted into themes to reveal the overlaps and connections between sources. To synthesize the source information, group the confetti notes according to common themes, conclusions, or any other meaningful category. Step six is to order the groupings. A review goes from the known to the unknown, and from the G 
general to the specific. Progressively more specific information is plotted downward on the inverted pyramid. Step 7 is to develop a viable research question out of an existing gap, inconsistency, or controversy that emerges from the literature. The top half of the research proposal hourglass contains the introduction. Most of the introduction consists of the literature review. Its information and the gaps it reveals funnel down to your research question, which in turn sets the stage for the bottom half of the hourglass, the research plan or the completed research paper. Now it's time for step eight, writing and referencing. Create a paragraph or two to correspond to each theme. Whenever you refer to confetti notes, use a citation in the format required by your teacher. The color of the note indicates its source. The ninth step is paragraph topic sentences. They summarize the paragraph's material and provide a strong backbone for your text. Note that, unlike in other formal writing you will do, each paragraph of a literature review stands alone with little need of transitions. Congratulations! You can now take a break and proceed to step 10, getting feedback. Research forms part of the ongoing conversation among scholars, so jump in and have a peer read your review. Consider returning to the sources, depending on the feedback you receive. After you've made any necessary adjustments, you're ready to move ahead in the production of your research plan or your research proposal. Now, if you want some help to plan your research, please watch the Decision Circuit activity video. Okay, so think about writing something down, and I'm going to slip to the other tool that I devised. We're sort of short for time and thinking the same way. So the other tool is called the decision circuit. So once the students prepare um, their literature review, they have to start thinking about if they have a research question, the research question is going to jump them or launch them into developing some kind of a research plan. So they have to make decisions. So I created um, particular decision boards that are directing them to make decisions. And they can do this uh, collegially, like sitting down and talking, well, what do you want to do? And I actually have a tape of two students working through um, the decision circuit together, showing that they're actually making decisions. Um, and the decision circuit video sort of explains how this decision circuit, which I designed, um, works for the students. So maybe just think as well, pedagogically, what do you find of interest or potentially useful or that you might want to transmit to others and think about that as well, okay? It's another three minutes, I think. And then I'll get to your, what you have on your boards. So think about writing something. <laughs> Under, pressure. Under pressure, ah, okay. Why does it not want to load now? This has nothing to do with the website. <laughs> I would just uh, uh, refresh your page. Hmm. Funny. It's never happened before, actually, so I don't know. And when one works, the other always works. I have no idea. Okay, I'll try. Any other suggestions? Mm, I didn't even think of it. That's what I have. Yeah, I'm trying the. Okay. Well, it's, this is the Chrome here. Sorry. And then open it up again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, guys.
Okay, I'm going to um, I'm going to abandon that. Okay, so the decision circuit is essentially uh, breaking it, the decisions down into boards. So there's decisions they need to make. What is a research question? And then where did this question come from? So when they're doing this alone, are they with a partner or a few other people? They need to address these questions. If they're wondering what is a research question, there's a glossary that it links to directly. So it will define what a research question is and give some examples in the glossary of what a research question is here. And then which are the two types of problem formulations would most likely help you to address your question? Is it more of a hypothesis or is it more of an interpretive thesis? And so here it gives definitions in a lengthier way of what's the difference between a hypothesis and what's the difference between an interpretive thesis. And it continues the approach for collecting and analyzing the data. Is it explanatory, exploratory, descriptive? Usually it's descriptive. What forms of data or information do you require? And so there's all kinds of different um, items on the menu to choose from, and they're all defined, like what are the different forms um, of data or information. The data collection techniques, um, I put it in the plural because it's usually not just one, and each of those is also defined. Um, what kind of data processing instruments might you need, like a, a notebook, perhaps a tape recorder, um, perhaps some kind of uh, other software. What types of units need to be measured? Sampling strategy, if that applies and explains why it's important to understand if you're using random sampling or non-random sampling. And then finally, what's, what are the, what's kind of analysis limitations and ethics are involved? So types of analysis, what are some of the limitations? Mm -hmm. And what are the ethical dimensions? And what I've done is I distinguish between ethical dimensions with respect to human subjects, ethical dimensions with respect to your responsibility towards citing where you're getting your sources from because it's praiseworthy behavior in social science research, any research to actually be leaning heavily on the shoulders of giants. Like that's a praiseworthy activity. Okay, so this tool, um, the decision circuit is available to the students. There's a glossary of terms. There's a video that explains how they can do it. And there's actually a practice run of two students talking about how they're making the decisions. So I'd love to see what maybe some of you have written down sort of to end our, our session. If that's okay. You don't have to have your names on them. I'll give you another second or two to, okay. I'll grab some of them. I'm going to post them up. Thank you. But it's going to be Let's just put a few up. I just want to see what your. Okay. Okay. So is the is the time up? Yes. Okay. Okay. So what I'll do is I'll just put the boards up, and uh, someone wants to take a photo of them. And I'm sorry we didn't have time for talking. Some technical difficulties, but. Uh, um, yeah. Thank you. You can always message me.